welcome again. We're talking about Nigeria's land borders now. The federal government, through the Minister for um, Minister of Finance, I think has not. I think I know has announced that um, uh, they have received the report of the committee set up to review the closure um, of our borders, and this will be submitted to the president. And that implies there is every likelihood that. Our borders will be reopened to traffic in the shortest possible time. But what are the implications of the border closure for the time that it was closed? And is there any optimism to the announcement that there is light at the end of the tunnel? Uh, we're joined to discuss this uh, by... Mr. Ambrose Imokwe. Uh, he joins us um, via Zoom. Thank you very much for joining us. Good morning. Okay, good morning. Um, your, your, your take on this uh, announcement, is it a cherry one for you or is it uh, uh, something you take with uh, some skepticism? Well, uh, this administration uh, is used to um, throwing some things at us uh, at very difficult times, maybe as uh, a way of uh, diverting our minds or a way of making us not take the issues at stake very seriously. Uh, first of all, why did they close the border? The reasons given, uh, proliferation of small arms, uh, uh, disadvantage of local farmers, uh, and all those kind of things, are things that uh, Nigerian taxpayers are actually paying some personnel to take care of. For example, the immigration. For example, the custom, the, the DSS, the armed forces. What are they doing? Why our borders porous? We cannot be doing our own job. We are doing your own job as a broadcaster. People are doing their different jobs in the Medicare, in the health sector, in the education. And people who are paid to police our borders are not doing their job. And then the whole Nigeria suffers for it. We have not been able to calculate. Maybe the economists were able to do that for us. Calculate the... Uh, damage, economic damage, uh, this uh, has uh, given Nigeria. For example, those who deal in inter-trade, uh, inter-border trades, for example, the, the traders, especially those who deal in commodities, uh, be it known that a lot of Nigerians do trade from the uh, uh, Bene, uh, Bene border, uh, the, the Cotonou uh, border with uh, Nigeria. Excellent. And a lot of Nigerians do trade along the West African coast of uh, you know, uh, Togo, uh, Senegal, Nigeria, and the uh, Bene Republic along that corridor. So it has affected so many people. Many businesses have gone under, uh, gone camotos. Uh, remember, by the time this issue was uh, also, this uh, directive was issued, a lot of Nigerians had their goods already at the port, in Port Novo and other ports along the uh, West African coast. So well, but, but what would you say to those who argue that the border closure was not effective because people still found ways to import um, things and, into the country? There are those who argue that it wasn't effective, really, because things still found their way in. Because if the borders have been closed and goods are still coming in, that means the goods have been smuggled in. And when goods are smuggled in, of course, there's a higher cost to that because not passing through the normal channel. Who pays for it at the, at the long run? It's still in Nigeria. The end users are paid for it. The consumer pay for this. And not the people who have clamped down on the border. So if the border was still porous, was still, uh, people were still coming in after the closure, that means the aim of closing the border given by the government is defeated. And that is why this is a cycle uh, of failures, where you just uh, wake up one morning, give directive, bring policies. And Nigeria have been, uh, have been uh, accused over the years of policy somersault. Uh, we don't think deeply about things. We just uh, do a staccato arrangement. We just... Uh, Okay. Act impulsively, and that has been what is happening to us. So, uh, economies are not run by impulse, they are not run by um, what we think is good, they are run by strategic thinking, they are run by long term visions and goals, and they are run by grounded policies that endure the test of time. But that is not what we have in this country. And then, when you flip flop about, uh, in fact, this uh, uh, opening of the borders. I dare to say that is premised on the fact that 
a company, uh, Dangote, was uh, was allowed to be the only one that would bring in... Uh, All right, Mr. Iboke, okay, before we get into uh, talking about uh, Dangote and, uh, you know, the statements of preferential treatment to some um, Im importers uh, against the rest, I, I want, you know, you to speak on our gains. Uh, the government in 2019 um, claimed that Nigeria was gaining about 2 billion naira daily um, you know, of course, after stopping the smuggling of petrol. Um, I, I want you to then speak also on the idea that uh, closure of the borders was going to improve on local production of rice and other items. Um, so would you say that we were able to achieve a lot in these 15 months that the borders were closed? Did local production in any way increase um, um, across the country? increased but again was it again i would say it was not again because it increased without the necessary uh will i say soccer for the farmers where the farmers giving uh, what was making local production not competitive was that we opened our borders and we didn't give our own farmers the necessary incentive to be able to uh, have a, a healthy competition with those who are important we didn't give them subsidy do our farmers have subsidies our farmers don't have subsidies. When you go to people like people that flood this country with importation of rice, for example, like Thailand, like China, and some other places, they have strong, very, very solid incentive and subsidy from their government. That is the only way your farmers can succeed. Although uh, government have come up with policies in agriculture, there are some World Bank assisted projects in that uh, respect, but we need to actually have a homegrown policy that is sustainable towards subsidizing the farmers. Otherwise, if you don't, they will continue to be disadvantageous. Why I said that the economic impact was not felt was, if you say we are increasing uh, production of rice locally, and then we are buying it at a more exorbitant price, that is voodoo economics. It doesn't add up. It doesn't. Because a bag of rice, 50 kg, is sold in different places between 25 to 35,000 naira. But when the borders were open, it was cheaper. So what we need to do for our farmers is not these uh, temporary measures. We need to empower our farmers by uh, and enabling them, by taking farming and agriculture as the number one export commodity or export service that Nigeria has to offer. It is right. only then we can concentrate on giving them the necessary subsidies, making the arrangement possible for them, and then the imported goods. Let me give you an example. Um, let's the, let's let's uh, let's um, see if we can uh, take as many issues as possible um, in your response. So we'll, we'll come back to uh, the effect on local businesses and a way forward. But this border closure ruffled a lot of feathers. We know that uh, Ghana and the Niger Republic were very vocal about their displeasure. Uh, some say that um, the damage caused by the closure might be more long term than we think. Do you agree with that position and what could be uh, the possible uh, spill out, um, uh, spill out uh, from this? Uh, one of the biggest issues about the closure, uh, which uh, the West African countries cried out about, is that it breaches the ECOWAS protocol on business. The ECOWAS protocol is supposed to be that the ECOWAS states are having uh, seamless business transactions across its bound by borders, across its seaports, and across uh, businesses across the countries. What Nigeria did was to, you know, contravene that protocol uh, unilaterally without even consulting its neighbors and just slammed uh, a border uh, closure on that. When Nigeria did that, maybe because it feels that it's the big, guy, uh, the big brother next door, we have the highest population. Most of the other African countries, you know, uh, depend on Nigeria for their own uh, goods and services. Uh, so, uh, first of all, the long-term effect that there will be mistrust uh, among ECOWAS countries uh, about Nigeria, and that is not good for us. Uh, our image uh, internationally has not been good then, but if added to our own neighbors not trusting us, it is not a good omen. Uh, generally, many businesses and economies have been affected uh, by this uh, border closure in the long term. What happens to the uh, borders? What happened to those who have lost businesses, who may not recover from them? What happened to uh, uh, businesses that are folded up because of this uh, border closure? 
what happens to the inflation that has occurred uh, during this border uh, closure. So these uh, uh, bilateral business relationships take a long time to build. A lot of them have been destroyed because of this uh, uh, border closure. Right. So yeah. Nigeria is in for a long haul of trying to rectify its uh, diplomatic and uh, bilateral economic, uh, uh, you know, not agreeing to those protocols that we, uh, we actually uh, switched over from what we agreed on and started doing things in our own way. And that is not good. Uh, for respecting international it's like, okay, people or some people might argue that uh, maybe the country needed to take these very stringent and harsh policies in order to force, you know, a certain um, 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 turn, you know, force a, you know, a change in our economic, you know, the picture of our whole economy. Uh, some people might also argue that, you know, these things were necessary in order to you know, wake Nigerians up to the need to, of course, uh, diversify our economy and diversify our income streams. Um, I'm not sure if, you know, you might agree with that, because this also remember this also happened in 1984 to 86 in that period. And, you know, people would also analysts, you know, say that it was a, a failure back then um, and wonder why we had to try it out again. Uh, but, you know, I want you to quickly share your thoughts on that one. If, if it was necessary that we take these knee-jerk reactions in order to force a change uh, with regards to our economy. Um, and then second is, do you think also that the recession has or is one of the reasons we, uh, the country might be having a rethink about uh, closed borders? Closed borders never pays any nation including the uh, all-sufficient advanced nations like the uh, United States of America and China. Uh, closed borders never pays anybody. And that is why all nations have been you know, advocating for open borders. Open borders means that you have control. It doesn't mean that uh, you open, you, when you don't close your border, you're supposed to have control. So what we have in Nigeria is that we have not done well. Uh, it, it doesn't go well for us. The, as you said, it's a knee-jerk approach. Knee-jerk approaches are never sustainable. Uh, I, 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 sometimes I wonder if we actually sit down to calculate the consequences of our economic decisions. And if we really do, we should have been able to know that closing border, especially a border that has economic uh, ties with you, where you also have a convention where you sign to, called the ECOWAS Convention of Single Trade along the corridor of ECOWAS, that you should not wake up one day and cancel it. Uh, as you refer to 1984, that is what we are seeing again, uh, unilateral decisions, and it, it smacks of a, a Gestapo style of, uh, of, of thinking, where you just wake up without consultation with your neighbors and take that decision. Uh, so in 1984, it was a disaster. Yeah. In 2020, it's also a disaster. Because Quick, quickly also speak. Is inflation. Yeah, but yeah, we, we've seen some of the, you know the you know effects of some of these dis decisions. Um, um, of course, you can look across prices of goods um, in the country today skyrocketing, you know, um, without any control. Um, but I, I I I think the government also might have seen these things and decided, you know, with the uh, recession that we just got into again, it's maybe necessary that we reopen the borders. Do you agree that the recession maybe? has you know pushed the government uh, to uh, back to take its decision uh, uh, just gets to the point of what i'm saying uh, maybe just maybe we might not have entered recession if the borders were open why do we then wait for the uh, recession to set in before we open the borders i think it doesn't need a superior economic reason it's just simple economic common sense that we shouldn't have done what we did and the recession, of course, you are right. The recession must have forced them to do a rethink. Because before, before the recession, they were still basking in the uh, illustry euphoria of uh, saying that, oh, our farmers are fantastic, doing well. Uh, the closing of borders has saved Nigeria $2 billion. But did you actually tell yourself how much it costs Nigeria? Uh, so these are the things. So I agree with you. The reception, recession would have cost everything. But again, it's coming very late, but maybe not too late. 
All right, let's talk about the, I alluded to that, uh, to read earlier, the issue of smuggling. Um, they say, people argue that the closure of the borders have intensified the level of smuggling um, age of goods into the country. And they're saying this is further amplified by government's um, various economic policies. A good example is the high dependence on the oil sector. Um, what's your thinking on this? And what would, in your thinking as well, be a long-term solution to the issue of smuggling with uh, the decision to possibly open the borders now? Firstly, the, what Nigeria should do is to multiply its uh, border ent uh, entry port entry points, simplify its port operations, and uh, I mean reduce its port tariffs. Nigeria's port tariffs and port system, port tariffs are one of the most expensive in the world, and in the West Africa uh, corridor is very expensive, the most expensive. That has forced many Nigerians to start using the ports in Benin Republic and the rest. Secondly, uh, the tariffs are very high, and then the port system in Nigeria is very complex, very, very complex. There are too many uh, government agencies, administrators, and uh, personnel, you know, try to be on one good. There is uh, people will come with NAVDAC, NAVDAC will be there, SON will be there, um, all kinds of agencies will be there, custom is there, immigration is there, uh, all kinds of people are in there in, inside that port. How do we simplify the port operations? Thirdly, for us to make any headway toward, against smuggling, we need to also multiply port uh, systems in Nigeria. For now, only the Apapa port is working in Nigeria. That is a very, very big misnomer for a, a country of over 200 million people. How can one port service a country of over 2 million people? What has happened to the other ports? What happened to the port in Wari? What happened to the port in Calabar? What happened to the port in... Uh, in a Port Harcourt. And then what has happened to the uh, inner depots, you know, where we are supposed to move some of these goods to. So we, we have not got it right. Where badges are also supposed to on a shell, on a shell port, for example, where small badges are supposed to run, they are not running. So this complicates the matters and slow down processes of importation. And what do people do? Desperate uh, traders, desperate people, we devise desperate means because uh, the normal routes are being clogged by the root crisis. And so that's why we see a, a, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, smuggling. If our port operations are efficient, if our cost tar uh, tariffs, uh, port tariffs are low, if um, we simplify our methods of, nobody wants to go through the stress of smuggling. It's a very difficult way to think to smuggling. And then also, when we say smuggling, it's a two-way thing. It is either the government officials that are supposed to be at the border to prevent it are collaborating or uh, colluding with uh, smugglers, or the smugglers are, or they are just simply inefficient. Therefore, okay. we ought to uh, really think deep and find a way to have a sustained port system policy that will enable uh, doing business, the ease of doing business in the ports, having multiple access to entries to ensure that uh, then having lower tariffs. In that way, you can now treat the root cause of smuggling. But if you say you want to deploy more personnel, tackle, have more gun trotting guys at the, at the border, that does not solve it because you have not attended to the root problem. So our root problem is our port operations, port tariff, port system. Once we fix that, then we can add incentive to the local manufacturers because that is the problem. Look at our textile industry, for example. Our textile industry is dead. Okay. So um, how Ms. will you now stop okay. Nigerians from importing clothes? You want us to go naked? So if, if we, we can put, like, okay, before we uh, go, before we go naked, uh, I, I, I want you to, of course, expand a little bit more on incentives that the government maybe should have put in place that would encourage local production. The argument all the while was that we needed to, you know, improve on local production of rice and, and, and the likes. Um, I, how do you think the government will address Nigerians with regards to this policy? and the benefits that the country was able to gain from this policy, um, and of course, moving forward. Do you think the government should, you know, in any way could admit that this policy failed um, entirely, 
Or will there be able, you know, ways that they should be able to convince Nigerians that we benefited from 15 months of border closure? And then second, speak also on the incentives that should have been able to improve on local production. You've just spoken on textiles now. You can also speak on uh, uh, food and uh, uh, food stuff, you know, across the country. Farming, agriculture, we're dealing with insecurity um, issues in uh, Benway State and other places that should contribute, to, you know, a lot to our agricultural sector. Um, we don't seem to have grown very much with regards to agriculture. So quickly uh, speaking on, on these two things, how should the government explain this policy to Nigerians and the gains that we were able to um, get from it? And then second, what truly um, are the incentives that the government should have put in place or invested more in, in the period that the borders were closed? Well, for me, uh, there are no gains during the border closure. Well, the gains we had was like a voodoo thing where you, you're collecting from the left, you are gaining from the left, and you are giving it out by the right. Because the whole thing we gained about uh, improving uh, in production of food and available by our farmers, uh, the, we paid for it uh, more by paying more exorbitantly for it. So we are robbing the masses to pay the farmers. It, 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 the economics in that way does not add up. So I would say we didn't gain. We, it was balanced out by the inflation that occurred. And then when you talk of uh, ways to improve uh, farming and agriculture in Nigeria, there are steps all over the years that have been taken, like the FADAMA project, some other projects, and the CADP, Commercial Agricultural Development Program. Um, and then there's the Agricultural Transformation Agenda, ATA, of the, uh, of the federal government. Uh, these are allowable policies, and they have helped to improve uh, agriculture much. Currently, uh, I know that there's an agriculture intervention program called uh, Appeals, which are growth processing and productivity enhancement and also livelihood improvement support. These are programs that are running now in six states, and uh, hopefully more states will join by next year. What the federal government is trying to do is actually trying to increase production because it's not enough to increase production. What of process, we lost a lot through post-harvest losses. A lot of post-harvest losses occur. So what the government is trying to do is that while we produce more, we have to have the capacity of take what we are producing and process them. And when that processing is done, we also have to uh, link the processors to the markets so that they can also have off-takers who will buy from them and sell. And also trying to, across the state, they are trying to identify, they have identified, uh, you know, commodity, uh, especially cash crops that are export desirable. For oh. example, we have the cocoa, we have uh, cashew, and we have ginger and some of those crops that have been identified to be able to push exports through agriculture. But um, uh, we, we, uh, what we need to do... Ms. Like, okay. Oh, um, I, I apologize uh, for, of course, the interruption. Um, I, I, we're almost out of time, so I just want you to, in a few seconds, speak on um, what next. If the borders are eventually reopened, do we, does the government still you know, maintain the ban on the importation of certain goods um, and, um, into the country? There are some uh, goods I would call sundry goods. I mean, why should we be importing tissue papers and, toilet and uh, toothpick and some of those inconsequential products? Those things have been banned before, and they should be banned. Why should we be importing uh, uh, juice and uh, soft uh, carbonated drinks into the country or uh, alcoholic beverages, for example? Those things should not be coming in here. So we agree with that. Those, we need some measures of, to ban those things. But at the same time, whatever we are banning, we should have to increase capacity for them to produce locally. And now that the borders are open, our farmers should not be left to go back to the days of Egypt, in the days of a, a wilderness, where they will not uh, have capacity to compete with importing uh, commodities. So what we need to do now is increase the, wrap up the capacity of our farmers, give them subsidies. They need to be subsidized so that they can be able to compete with right. uh, uh, any goods that will be imported. In that way, we are placing our local producers in a footstep that we're able to compete favorably. Thank you very much. I'm Brice Iboke. Thank you so much for speaking with us um, all the way from uh, Inugu State this morning and uh, looking forward to having another conversation with you as uh, soon as possible. Thank you very much. Right. Um, really uh, strong points uh, he kept uh, dropping yeah. uh, for us. Um, uh, we're hoping that the borders will be opened.
and we're hoping that the damage cost to our relationship with our neighboring countries will not be lasting. We're also hoping that the federal government will do the needful to improve on border security as well as the personnel that work there because um, one issue that will continue to plague us if we don't do what we need to do is smuggling. Officials aid, there is, it's not a secret that officials at the ports aid the, import, uh, the uh, smuggling of uh, setting uh, contraband into the country, and that also needs uh, to be addressed so that uh, small farmers uh, can you know, make uh, do. And my concern, though, I didn't have the opportunity to ask him. Um, he alluded to some of it, but I still was unsatisfied. Uh, the issue of um, these petty traders who use the a Bene border to import perishable items like tomato, um, yes. like um, rice, and some of these things that don't last. Will they survive? How will they, you know, you know, rebound from the effect of the border closure? Is there any incentive from the government to help them pick up the pieces and grow again? These are there are so many issues. Really. The the. Um I don't see any reason why we shouldn't be able to grow our own tomato in the first place. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't be able to grow our own onions, our own cabbages, our own carrots, our own yams, and, and every other thing that might be imported. Our own, we should have enough poultry farms in the country to, to feed Nigeria. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we have so many reasons why these things don't work. You know, the security issue that I mentioned earlier, uh, Benue State, which is the food basket of the nation, um, you know, of course, has suffered a lot of issues with insecurity and very likely has not been able to keep up with the demands um, of feeding the nation. Um, unfortunately, also, Nigeria is a country that doesn't have very precise and, and um, acute uh, uh, statistics on what our gains are and what our losses are. The NBS tries its best, the uh, National Bureau of Statistics, to um, give us figures every now and then. But what truly did we gain with the um, um, war against proliferation of uh, small arms? In what ways did the closure of the border stop all of that? You know, if we're still seeing the level of insecurity that we're seeing in the country today, in what ways also did we improve on uh, the uh, production of local rice and getting Nigerians to uh, buy more local rice. Look, you look at the figures in the market today, 30 to 40,000 naira for a bag of rice. One thing that I'm also looking forward to is seeing how the government will address these things to Nigerians. You close the border for 15 months. How would you speak to Nigerians now on the gains of closing the border for 15 months? Will the government be able to tell Nigerians that that policy failed? Or not. Well, uh, I doubt that would be the response we'll get, but let's see what happens in the coming days and how soon the borders will indeed be opened after the president reviews the report of the committee that was set up uh, to review. Hello, the hope you enjoyed the news. Please do subscribe to our YouTube channel and don't forget to hit the notification button so you get notified about fresh news updates.